Well, it's a great pleasure to be here in Oslo. I was here many years ago, but uh, only for a, a day, I think. So this is a more, a more complete experience. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to people here and uh, to explain the title of this book here, which was published by the Princeton University Press just very recently. I think the title came to me when I gave in 2003, I think it was, a series of three talks at the invitation of the Princeton University Press. And they woke me up too early in the morning and wanted a title for the series of lectures. And I gave them this one without quite thinking what I was doing. But uh, I do mean what I say about these topics. You might think these things are not totally polite when one's talking about physical theory. Uh, I want to explain something about each one of these words and why I think they have some relevance. First of all, I, let me say something about fas fashionable theories of physics. In fact, fashionable theories it suggests something that they are attractive in some aesthetic way and not necessarily to do with the way the world operates. But this is a very old idea. And let me, if I can figure out how to make this thing work here, um, go to the first. You see, this is quite an ancient theory of physics. And you see these. The, originally, the four elements were the four known polyhedra. And then, of course, another one, the dodecahedron, was discovered. So they had to find another element. This was the, the firmament or the ether which described the way the planets behaved, which seemed to be completely different from things on Earth. Um, it's, of course, very beautiful, because what could be more beautiful than these wonderful polyhedra? But has it got any more content than that? Well, I believe it is supposed to have, I'm not quite sure what, but it's perhaps illustrated by the fact that um, if you take a cube, you see, in fact, if you take two cubes, you can cut them up and reassemble them to make two tetrahedra, and one octahedron. And this illustrates that if you take two sticks, which are obviously made of solid things, so they're earth, and rub them together, you get fire and smoke. So I suppose it explains that. That's about the only thing I know it explains. But it, you, as a nice little exercise, you might see how to cut two cubes up into two tetra tetrahedra and one octahedron. OK, that's my only exercise, which I'm going to give you. Um, let me move ahead and describe what I want to talk about. In modern physics, I should explain that there are many fashionable theories. Of course, some of them also beautiful in their way. And Fire had the phlogiston theory and then the caloric theory and so on, which didn't turn out to not to be so appropriate. But what we now believe in physics is one of the most appropriate ways of describing the way bodies behave is in terms of particles. And these are what are called Feynman diagrams. I'm going to assume that people here don't know uh, these physical ideas, but there will be perhaps who know all about these things as well. Um, think of these, you see, in this picture here, I've got, I'm sorry, I meant to go, I've jumped ahead. And it's jumped to something else. I don't quite, I'm not very expert on these machines. Why did it do that? <laughs> did I press something which I shouldn't have done? Um, it's not doing quite what I meant. Somebody help me. Uh, <laughs> can you... Oh, it's there, is it? Yes, thank you very much, yes. I should remember not to do what I just did, which I don't know what it was, so. <laughs> but never mind, let's go ahead. Yeah, so we had those. And these are, as I say, Feynman diagrams. In my pictures, time tends to go from bottom to top, so you see it's going upwards there. If you're a particle physicist, time goes from left to right. So for the purposes of these lectures, I'm, I'm a relativist, which means time goes that way. So here you see, these are examples. Think of these as particles, which are represented by lines, because that means the history of that particle as a line like this. And this is another history of another particle. They combine together to make a third, and then that splits into two others. And then you have other combinations of things happening like that. And for each one of these pictures, you have a ex mathematical expression. And these are very important in current particle physics uh, and quantum field theory. Uh, that's the way people do calculations in these subjects. The problem arises mainly when you have diagrams which are like the one which we have on the right-hand side here, where you have closed loops, and these give you the answer infinity, which is a bit of a nuisance. And since these are the only ones which really bring out the quantum mechanical features, you need to have a, 
a finite value for that. And there are all sorts of very clever ways in which the particle physicists, quantum field theorists, manage to get finite answers out of these things. But it's a nuisance, and you often can't get the finite answers you want, and you have to play all sorts of tricks and so on. So the idea was introduced, I think, mainly by Nanbu, who is a Japanese-American physicist, that you replace these world lines of single points, so they're lines. You imagine, instead of having the ele elementary object not being a point, but a little loop, and then the history of that loop is a little pipe, and so you have this sort of plumbing going on here with these various uh, pipes joining up like this. And the important thing about these is basically that you can expect to get finite answers from these expressions. They also tie up with very beautiful mathematical ideas known as Riemann surfaces, and these things are, were very suggestive of all sorts of finite expressions you could get. And I found the idea extremely attractive when I was first introduced to it. It seemed to me this was a really powerful new development which could give you great insights into particle physics. Well, that was fine until people suddenly realized that you could only make it work if space had 25 dimensions. I didn't think space had 25 dimensions, and so I was troubled by this. And I had various reasons for worrying about this. Time still has one dimension going up in these pictures, but you have to imagine that these things exist in a huge space with lots and lots of dimensions. Now, there are ways of getting around that, which I'll come to in a minute, but uh, I didn't like the idea for reasons which I'm going to outline to you. And these are reasons which, for some reason, are never taken very seriously by particle physicists and people uh, who worry, who think about theories in extra dimensions. But so let me, as a little interlude or uh, preliminary to what I want to say later, let's just do a little bit of... So the only piece of mathematics which I'm really going to do here, and it's basically elementary. Look at the picture at the top. This is raising a number to a power. So a to the power b means a multiplied by itself b times. So you have a, a b of these a's all multiplied together. Now, you might decide to raise a to the power b to the c, a to the b to the c. First of all, I have to make clear what that means. It doesn't mean a, a to the b to the c, because that, if you had a to the b to the c, you could write that more simply as a to the bc. So I don't mean that. I mean a to the b to the c. So in other words, that means a to a times itself, b to the c times. So the number of a's here is... B, B times B times B, B times B, C times, okay? Now, I'll just to give an example of one of these things, there's a thing called a Google, which I believe was introduced by the nine-year-old nephew as a, a distinguished mathematician, and uh, he wanted to have a really big number. And so he said, imagine one zero, 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 100 zeros. That would be 10 to the 100, you see? And so he thought this was probably as big as you could imagine. In fact, it does come into the things which I talk about in the book. You might think what a Google has got to do with cosmology or something. Well, roughly speaking, we we're going to have... I'll talk about black holes later. That The biggest black holes that one expects to occur in the universe, they will eventually evaporate away according to what's known as the Hawking process. We were hearing about Hawking a minute ago, and this is something where I completely agree with him, that these black holes will eventually evaporate away and just go mainly into, into radiation. How long will that take? Well, roughly speaking, a Google years. So there's a Google coming into it. What about the next thing? Well, uh, the nephew of this mathematician, Kasner, thought, well, uh, let's have a bigger one. So he said, well, let's write uh, as many zeros as you can possibly think of, and the largest number that could be thought of, he th thought, was a Google number of zeros. Suppose you have a Google zeros here. Well, that is 10 to the 10 to the 100. So that's an example of one of these double exponents. So a Google, Google Plex is what they call it. And I think uh, the, the nine-year-old fellow had to, had to be had a little bit, bit of help for, from his uncle on that one. But uh, that was, anyway... Now, uh, what I want to say about these double exponents, when you have a to the b to the c, so we, as we've got up at the top there, a to the b to the c, it really doesn't make much difference what a is. If these are reasonably big numbers, it's c is the really important one. And just to give you an example, if you take... Um, well, what's the reason for this number here? That also comes into what I want to say in my, in my book, namely, it's sort of how unlikely 
was it? See, the Big Bang apparently seemed to have been the beginning of the universe. I'll come to that later on in the talk. But this Big Bang could have been all sorts of possible. It's what's known as a singularity. It's uh, something where the equations go wrong, that you've got to have a place where the equations go wrong uh, to start the whole thing off. But the thing is that the number of places, number of ways it can go wrong is so enormous that the very special nature of the Big Bang that we actually seem to have had, how special was it? Well, it's about 1 in 10 to the power, 10 to the power, 124. You can actually work these numbers out, which is a bit surprising. But that number, it's a double exponent, you see, 10 to the 10 to the 124. Well, we, I had a Google Plex a little bit ago. That would have been 10 to the 10 to the 100. Well, this is a bit bigger than that. It's about a Google Plex raised to the power a million, million, million. I forget how many millions it is now. Million, 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 I think. Um, so it's a, a pretty big number. And, but the thing is, suppose we change that 10 to a 2, that number at the top hardly changes at all. It's still 124.5 something or other. So it's not much bigger. You need this a huge change from 10 to 2. You might think that makes an enormous difference. But as far as this number at the top is concerned, it makes practically no difference at all. So what I want to say is that this number at the top is the all-important number. The ones at the bottom don't matter too much. Well, I'm going to say a little bit more about what I really mean here. These numbers do come in, these huge numbers do have some role to play in, in what I talk about in the book. But more important is something else here, which is... See, I'm going to introduce an idea of these numbers becoming infinite. So the numbers could go as big as infinity. And I'm going to try and explain what I mean. See, if I write I infinity to the power 1, think of that as the number of points on a curve or on a line. If I put infinity to the power 2, that's the number of points on a surface, which could be flat or curved, to the power 3 on a three-dimensional space, or to the power n to an n-dimensional space. Now, some of you might have heard of Cantor's theory of infinite numbers. I want to say that this is not the same. This is a little bit more refined in some respects. The ideas go back to... Uh, at least to, to the beginning of the 20th century when the French math distinguished French mathematician Elie Cartan introduced ideas of this nature, and I think perhaps the Italian geometers before that. So these are, well, good notions, mathematical notions, but they're not much appreciated, as far as I can see, uh, in, in physics. So let me... Um, say this is just something it's not. So if you know about the Cantor, and it, this is just to show you that if you have a pair of numbers, and suppose these are just natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whole numbers, then if you have a pair of them, it's not any more than, than, than a single one because you could just enumerate them by going backwards and forwards as these arrows point and cover the whole quarter plane in that way. But the thing is that it's not very continuous because you can have things which are close together uh, such as, if I can find them, those two at the top there, we have to go all the way down here and come back again before the pairs of numbers get to, to where you, these close points here. So it's not very continuous. I just show you, it was really to show you what it's not. So don't bother to follow this too closely if you don't want to. What is it, though, that I'm talking about? Well, I'm talking about functions. So let's think of a function on the plane. You could just imagine a graph, you see, in the x-axis is going along at the bottom, so that's this uh, line going this way, and the y-axis is going up, so I'm thinking of a number of different graphs you could have. But if these are discrete, so this is just discrete numbers, and suppose there are A of them going upwards and B of them going downwards, how many, of, how many possible functions are there? Well, you see, the first value could be any of... of um, sorry, which way goes going? Yeah. First, first value is any of A possible values that way. The next one has A possible values, so the number of, of those two together is A times A. This has A, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, so the number of possible graphs is A times A times A times A, B times, in other words, A to the B. And that's what this is. So the number of these functions that you could have of the discrete variables is A to the B. Now let's suppose these are continuous. So you have a curve which wiggles around like this. How many of those curves are there? Well, you see, the number going this way, as I said before, will be um, 
infinity to the b, the number going that will be infinity to the a, so there are infinity to the a to the infinity to the b number of different curves. In other words, infinity to the in infinity to the a, infinity to the b, which is this thing here. I'll give you an example of the sort of thing I mean. Suppose you have an electric field in three space. How many electric fields are there? You say, well, how many are there? Well, at each point, you see, you can have one of these arrows, which is where the electric field is. It has a certain strength in a certain direction. That's three numbers for each. Three components would determine where that arrow is, how, how long it is, and which way it points. Three numbers would determine that at each point. So that the number of these different electric fields in this notation would be, well, you see, infinity to the 3 infinity to the 3. Now, it's a coincidence sort of here that the 3s are the same 3, but the 3 at the top is the number of dimensions of the space, and that's the important one, is what I'm trying to say. That's the important one. The 3 at the bottom is just the number of components of the field. And I'm trying to say it's the one at the top which is really important. And if it was, say, a temperature field, then they would, the 3 at the bottom would be only 1. But the three at the top would still be three. Whereas if you were in a bigger number of dimensions, that three would be a bigger number. OK, so let's go on then. So what am I saying here? Um, here in my electric field. I'm saying that A to, to the B is bigger than... A, a, sorry, infinity to the A is bigger than infinity to the B if A is bigger than B. Well, that's just saying... In this notation, the number of points on a bigger space is bigger than the number of points on a smaller dimensional space. But what about the number of functions on a bigger space? Well, it doesn't matter how many components they've got. You see, a infinity to the a to the infinity to the b, that means a b-dimensional space, and a is the number of components, is much, much, much greater than infinity to the c to the infinity to the d, where the d is now the dimension of the sp second space, and if B is bigger than D, the first one is always going to be completely swamped the second one. So what I'm trying to say is it doesn't matter how many components you're talking about. If you're working in a space which has more dimensions, there will be huge numbers of functions which will completely swamp everything. So if you've got a theory which is supposed to have hidden dimensions, more numbers of dimensions than the three dimensions we see, those hidden dimension would completely swamp everything. So this was the, one of the main reasons I worried about having extra sort of hidden dimensions. Well, how do the string theorists think about it? Well, they point, first of all, they'll point to this example. You see, this is something not very long after Einstein introduced his general theory of relativity. See, his general theory of relativity is the theory of gravity, which explains gravity in terms of a curvature of space-time. So you had three dimensions of space and one of time, and you curve the space up, and the curvature of that space gives you a theory of gravity, which is a marvelous theory. You probably, people here will have heard of the LIGO observations recently, which seem to indicate that there have been gravitational waves coming to us from uh, black holes swallowing each other up a long, long time ago and causing a great big explosion with the waves coming and hitting these devices. It's a very, very slight effect, but they detect that, those things, which is a huge confirmation of Einstein's theory. So the theory works extremely well. But it's, as it certainly is originally posed, it's just a theory of gravity. And of course, there's lots of other things going on than gravity. The main thing we need to understand is electromagnetism. So, James Clerk Maxwell has a wonderful set of equations which describe how electricity and magnetism interrelate to each other and how they propagate as light and radio waves. And these things are fantastic, work incredibly well too. But how do they fit in with this idea of a curved idea to space? Well, there was a Polish-German uh, mathematician called Kaluza who realized that if you add an extra dimension to the space-time, make it five-dimensional, then you can incorporate electromagnetism in a beautiful way into this theory. The trouble is it's got extra dimensions. So how do you make sense of this theory, which has got five dimensions? And the string theorists will point to this. They say, well, Kaluza had this wonderful theory, and that seems to work well, so what's wrong with extra dimensions? But the point that 
I'm trying to make here is that it's not really a theory in, fi in five dimensions. It's a theory in four dimensions. And when I say four dimensions, I mean four space-time dimensions. And in all these cases, you can forget about the time because the equations simply carry on what's, what's going in the space determines what's going on in the time. The equations are always such that they, they're deterministic and they carry on into time. So it's really the space dimensions that will be important here. So the, the M here at the, at the bottom is the dimension of space-time. So it's got three dimensions of space and one of time. So the functional freedom will be that of three-dimensional space. The number at the top will be the three, you see. What about the extra one, which comes from this extra dimension? Well, the point about the Kaluza theory is that it's got a symmetry along those dimensions. This is what, an example of what's called a bundle, where you've actually got a symmetry in those dimensions, and you're not allowed to monkey with that symmetry. If you do, then you have a new theory. But that's the sort of idea that in string theory, you don't think of it this way. You tend to think of it as really a five-dimensional space or 25 to 26 dimensional space time, and you're allowed to wiggle all the things up at the top as well as at the bottom. But if you're thinking of it in the way that Kaluza originally meant, it's not like that at all. It's like, um, well, this is just an example of what a bundle is like, so don't worry too much if this is incomprehensible. But <laughs> the picture of the left is meant to be an, an ordinary graph, as I had before and two slides ago, I think, where you're thinking of functions, which is a line going across. Um, here, and then these are the different values for each um, point at the bottom. And then you think of generalizing that. So each of these things could be some complicated space. The one at the bottom, that's, this, that's the four-dimensional space-time, if you like. And these bits at the top are these things called the fibers. So that's the, the loops that we have in the picture here. And they can be a bigger space, too. So we have to distinguish the idea of the whole bundle you see, the whole bundle has a dimension, which is the one of M plus the one number of dimensions of F being the fiber. And uh, don't worry too much about this, because I just want to show you what a, a fiber bundle is. It's, if you like, it's an M's worth of B's. That's the way I like to think of it. The B is some space, and if you've got M's worth of them, then you've got each point on the M. Well, each point on the M has a, has a B sort of associated with it. Don't worry too much, but the, moral, see, the normal way you think of these things is that the B doesn't contain functional information. Your fields are not on the B, it's on the M. Whereas the way string theorists think about it, they think, no, it's the whole space, which is the higher dimensional space that they're talking about. Okay, well, why do they say you don't see all these extra dimensions? Well, this is the picture of what a string theorist would say. OK, this is an analog, you see, of the higher dimensional space. This is this hose pipe. And if you stand a long way from the hose pipe, it looks like a one-dimensional thing. So you see, as you follow along here, you get a one-dimensional thing. But if you look very closely, you get a magnifying glass out, and you look at it, you see the surface. I'm just talking about the surface of the hose pipe. It's a two-dimensional thing. It really is two-dimensional, but it looks from a distance one-dimensional. So the idea is the extra dimensions are going to be tucked up so small that you don't see them. And the way they say it is a slightly different way. They say, the, in order to excite all these extra dimensions, you see all this extra functional freedom which is hiding there in these extra dimensions, in order to let loose those extra freedoms that we don't see, we only see functions of three variables in ordinary physics, why don't we see these functions of... 25 dimensions, you see that you have to think of this as being a 25-dimensional surface there. Why don't we see that? Well, they say, well, it's so small that you would need an enormous energy to excite those extra dimensions. Now, an enormous energy, how much would it be? Well, they're thinking in terms of accelerate, you know, like the accelerator uh, at CERN, the, the uh, Large Hadron Collider. I mean, what sort of energy would you need well, you can work out the energy by seeing how long it would take a light signal to go down the loop, and then you basically take the reciprocal of that. So if it's a very small loop, it's a very big energy. And so the amount of energy you would need to excite that will be something like a large artillery shell, so a real huge explosion. And the picture is that you'd have to have that much energy in a single particle. I think that's the argument they use. But to me, that's completely misleading picture, 
because that amount of energy to excite the extra dimensions is for the entire universe. And for the entire universe, a sizable artillery shell is just nothing. So here is the example I want to give. You see, here is this little... Think of the thing at the bottom here as the hose pipe, but now it's really got... Uh, the ordinary space-time at the bottom here is the ordinary three-dimensional space here, four-dimensional space-time. And this loop, then, has got lots and lots of extra dimensions here. And why are they going to be kept immune from disturbing the rest of the universe? Well, because, yet they say, it would need this artillery shell to excite it. But think of the Earth's motion around the sun. Well, it's millions and millions and millions times much more than the energy in an artillery shell. I mean, it's ridiculously more. So the amount of energy that's in this Earth's motion would be qu easily enough to excite this extra dimension in the dimension of the Earth's orbit. But you've really got to use the whole universe, and this is completely trivial. Now, you see, I also say, if you want to excite this by any significant amount, you would need lots and lots and lots of, um, well, uh, quanta, if you like, so that it's really a classical problem. You see, the, the quantum argument that you need all this much energy becomes a bit irrelevant in this circumstance because to disturb this at all, you really need loads and loads of quanta, and that means it's really a classical picture. You have to read the book to see uh, more of the argument. But the idea is that really, to say that it's a lot of energy to excite the energy in the extra dimensions is really misleading because it's really a tiny amount of energy for the entire universe, which is all you're trying to do here, all you're trying to do for the entire universe, uh, is easily the energy. All sorts of processes in, in, in nature would be far, far more than to excite that amount of energy. So this was the sort of reason that uh, I was very skeptical of the, the uh, ideas of extra space dimensions. Um, I should say that this argument perhaps not in the sort of detail I'm giving you here. This argument is something I gave at a conference which was in honor of Stephen Hawking, in one of his birthdays, whichever it would be, uh, when in 2002, I think, which was before I gave the Princeton Lectures. And there was a write-up, and so I don't quite know why, since then, uh, nobody's paid any attention to the argument, but it's in the book, so they'll have to pay attention to that. Anyway, that was the... Fashion issue, and why I have trouble with it, is this question of the extra dimensions. As I said before, the string idea, I quite like. I really liked it. I thought there was a... If you could do it without ha having to introduce the extra dimensions, that would be fine by me. But nobody could seem to think of how to make it work, which uh, didn't require... Well, it was originally 25 extra dimensions, then it became 9. They managed to get it down to 9. And then it goes back up to 10 and back to 25 at the same time, and it's very confusing. But um, nevertheless, it never gets down to the right number, which would be three. Okay, now what about the... <coughs> what about the faith? Well, I was talking about string theory, which is a big fish, in a sense, that lots of people play with those ideas, and it has a great influence on mathematics. It certainly... As a stimulus to ideas in mathematics, string theory has been very powerful. But as a theory of physics, I don't think the case is made at all. It has problems it being actually a physical theory. Now, this is something completely different. This is quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics has absolutely enormous numbers of implications in the physical world. See, string theory, sometimes people would say, well, it's a wonderful theory, but uh, it doesn't have any applications doesn't have the experiments, you can test it. Quantum mechanics is completely different. There are experiments all over the place. And it's obviously a fantastically good theory, uh, which gives us uh, results that we couldn't get from classical arguments. Classical means uh, pre-quantum, if you like, things which are not to do with quantum mechanics in, in physics. And here is the sort of prototype kind of quantum mechanical experiment, which is called the two-slit experiment, you have here a, 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 an electron gun or some, something which emits quantum particles. And here we have two slits, which the particle have to go to, through to get the screen at the back. Now, if you cover up one of the slits 
and then just go through the other, you see a scattering of points. So you can see the point-like behavior of these particles, the particle-like behavior. They're kind of mostly in, in a line with the, say, the electron gun and the, and the screen, but the scattering both ways. Close that slit, open the other, you find a very similar scattering of points, slightly shifted to the right because the slit's off to the right, but nevertheless very similar. What happens when you open both? Well, you might expect that a superposition of these two pictures would occur, but not a bit of it. What you suddenly find is these lines, interference lines, that somehow the different routes that the particle can take interfere with each other. And it's a very strange thing. Some places you find that it's stronger than what you would get to add the adding these two pictures, like the point P here. Some oh no, P is, I forget which is which, and I can't see it very well. P is probably in the middle, isn't it? Some places it cancels out completely. So in the places, how could it be that you, you can't reach certain places on the screen that could be perfectly reached when one or the other is open? And the uh, explanation that's given, and the way one understands this in standard quantum mechanics, is to say the particle somehow goes through both slits at once, and the different alternatives interfere with each, uh, with each other in a, in a way which is a bit like waves. So you have to say, no, the particle doesn't just go through one slit or the other, it goes through both at once, which is a very strange idea for what a particle could do. And then people say, well, you know, this is a general rule of quantum mechanics, and there are experiments like this involving not just single particles, but these things called buckyballs, which are uh, carbon molecules which involve uh, 60 or 70 different carbons. And they, again, still behave like this. So the argument is, if quantum mechanics holds right the way up at all levels, this would still hold for a Schrodinger's cat. Well, you see, Schrodinger introduced his notion of a cat uh, as a more or less a contradiction to his own equation. He was more or less saying, if, <coughs> if his equation, let's say Schrodinger talking, if my equation holds all the way up, then you could have a cat which was dead and alive at the same time. And he's more or less saying, this is ridiculous, there's got to be some change in the way we understand quantum mechanics. And so he was very worried about these things, quite rightly. Now, I, this is my example of Schrodinger's cat. It's a little bit more humane, because you don't kill the cat, but you have this device known as a beam splitter here, uh, which, um, make sure I don't press the wrong button, which I'm liable to do. Yes, I, didn't press, I did press the wrong button. <laughs> Where am I going? Yes. Uh, you have a beam splitter, which is the thing at the top here, which sends a photon down. It hits, this is the, sorry, this is the laser which aims the single particle at the beam splitter, well, that's sometimes you'd call it a half-silvered mirror, so that half the light goes through, half is reflected, so that the particle itself shares its existence between going through and being reflected. So it's in two places at once, which is all right for particles. Now this one hits a, a device here which detects it, and if the photon goes this way, it opens that door. If it comes this way, it opens the other door. And if Schrodinger's equation continues to hold, then it would be a superposition of both one door being open and the other closed, or the other open and the, and the one closed. And the poor old cat, is, he's sitting here and deciding it's going to go through the open door, but the, it's in the superposition of one door and the other, so it has to be in the superposition of going through one door and going through the other door, which of course is nonsense. That wouldn't happen. You could easily set up this experiment and one or the other door would open and the cat would go through that door. So it doesn't follow the Schrodinger equation. That's more or less what Schrodinger was complaining about, that his equation uh, doesn't answer all the questions about what things do in the world. But on the other hand, most physicists, I find, they do seem to think that really both things do happen, and somehow it's, I don't know, looking at the cat, which is what determines it. Does the cat look at itself or, or what? It's not quite clear. Now, my... <coughs> the next slide here was stimulated. I was asked a few years ago by the Hans Christian Andersen Society to give a lecture in honor of Hans Christian Andersen's 200th anniversary. And uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't quite the, it was a year or two before, but it was part of a series of talks. And I wondered why on earth am I being asked to give this talk? 
But then I thought, well, I did give a, write a book once called The Emperor's New Mind, which, of course, was a play on the idea of The Emperor's New Clothes, which was a Hans Christian Andersen story. So uh, I tried to think, well, I don't want to talk about that because that's not what I've been thinking about recently. And I tried to think of another Hans Christian Andersen story which reflected the ideas that I was playing with at the time. And these had to do with quantum mechanics and the foundations of quantum mechanics. And I realized that The Little Mermaid, in many ways, there was another... This is just one of the main ways, ways that he, she was illustrating something I want to say. There were other ways, too, like when she gets hit by a, the first ray of the sun, which is a photon, you see, so you put a beam splitter in the way, and it's, it'd be a, a Schrodinger's mermaid. But that's not what I'm talking about here. The mermaid here <coughs> is... Well, she's looking... Let me see what... I'll try and explain a bit more what she's doing by the next picture. You see here, the bottom part of the picture represents the quantum world. That's the world where Schrodinger's equation holds good. I use the letter U because it's what's called unitary evolution. So this is the... It chugs along according to the Schrodinger equation and it evolves, the quantum state evolves in this completely deterministic way. The top part of the picture is the classical world, where, whereas in the bottom you think it's all sort of a mess with strange creatures which you don't fully understand and they're tangled up in complicated ways. The top place you have separated objects. It's the much more familiar world of classical physics. So that's what that's meant to be. So that's the... That, I've done it again. Let's go back. That's the classical world at the top and the quantum world at the bottom. And what's the mermaid doing? Well, you see, she shares both worlds. She's part fish, part human. And she represents, well, what you do when you make a measurement in quantum mechanics. I'll come to that just in a minute. But to make sense of what the Schrodinger state tells you, you have to do what's called making a measurement. And somehow this um, produces a classical result. A typical example would be a Geiger counter. So that's a device for detecting quantum particles. The particle enters the Geiger counter, it makes a click, and the click is something you can hear, so that's a sort of classical world thing. But somehow it magnifies the ef quantum effect up to the classical world, and that's the way we think of a Geiger counter. But that's not following Schrodinger's equation. And it's not supposed to. The way you do quantum mechanics is to change your mind and do something quite different. And that's the reduction of the quantum state or the collapse of the wave function. And that's what the mermaid represents. So she somehow represents this mysterious way in which the quantum bits of the quantum world come up and become part of the classical world. The classical world C and the state reduction that the mermaid represents is R. And so I made her, tried to make her look a little bit mysterious as well. She's got funny ears and so on. But this is the, the role that she's playing. And also, there's something else about the picture. It's a little bit strange about the perspective, which is, in a sense, deliberate, because she's bringing her perspective onto the classical world, which she gains from her experience underneath and kind of looks down on it. And that's the role that she's playing here. But how does one do quantum mechanics? You see, you might say, well, a Geiger counter is just made up of ordinary quantum particles, so why doesn't it play according to the Schrodinger equation? Well, that's a good question. But what do we do in quantum mechanics? Well, this is what we do. Here's, in this particular diagram, time is going left to right, so I, that's not me being a relativist this way. That's time going in the quantum field theory way. And now, here we have the quantum state, so that's what quantum mechanics talks about. And then it evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, or unitary evolution. That's the U thing. And then you can reinterpret that when you make a measurement as a different set of alternatives. And then suddenly one of these alternatives, by simply probabilistic rules, it's a matter of probability, one of them happens and then it, this one evolves. And then suddenly it jumps and then another one evolves and then so on. And that's the way we do quantum mechanics. And Schrodinger didn't like this at all. He, he made a comment when he was visiting Niels Bohr, I think. He said, if, if, it, if all this quant damn quantum jumping is here to stay, I wish I had nothing to do with quantum mechanics. Uh, so it's as well that he managed to, to get over his worries about that somehow. But anyway, he was, I think, trying to indicate that there is something, a better theory needs to come along someday and uh, explain what's really going on in the world. 
There are many people, I should say, who take the view, no, no, all these things do happen at once, and there are all these worlds when the quantum choice is made and all different worlds are all somehow superposed together, and it's our, somehow our conscious perceptions only seem to perceive one world. I've never understood that. I've always thought that was more or less a, a reductio ad absurdum. That's not the world we know about behaves, how it behaves. It behaves like this picture, which is very odd indeed. So it seems to me we need a better theory. Now, uh, as I said, Schrodinger was very worried about this picture. Einstein was worried about this picture. De Broglie was worried about this picture. Even Dirac, who is personally, he introduced the formalism, which pretty well all people who work with quantum mechanics use. And he, although he was a sort of modest person who didn't express his views very much, you can find places where he did actually say quantum mechanics is the provisional theory and we're going to need a better one. There's a nice quote I got from somebody which is in, 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 the, in the book. Now, what kind of a theory would it be which makes sense of all this? Now, my own view, and there are various reasons for this, is when you combine quantum mechanics in an appropriate way with Einstein's general theory of relativity. Because there are certain tensions between these two theories. People often say, well, what you need is a theory of quantum gravity. When they say quantum gravity, they really mean use the rules of quantum mechanics, uh, apply those rules to gravitational theory, quantize general relativity. My view is that that's wrong. You have to have a theory, not that one imposes itself on the other theory, but where there's give on both sides. So it has to be a much more even-handed marriage where there is give on the side of quantum mechanics. It needs help, because this picture, it seems to me, needs help. It's not really a, a plausible view of, of how, to, how the world should behave. It's got to have some deeper role for it. So here I'm going to just indicate the sort of picture that I have of the tension between quantum mechanics and general relativity. And here we have an experiment. When I drew this picture and it sent to the person in charge of the diagrams in Princeton Press, he said, I don't think it's very good. It's not very clear what this dial is saying and things like that. What he didn't realize is it's a completely fabricated thing. It doesn't mean anything because that complete science fiction piece of apparatus at the top. But the point about it is, it's a quantum experiment which involves the Earth's gravitational field. So we have the Earth's field, which is supposed to be taken into consideration. Now, there are two ways you could do this. One is the way probably most physicists would do. They simply do what's called putting a term in the Hamiltonian corresponding to the Earth's gravitational potential. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. But it's a standard procedure for putting in a force into your quantum system. And that's what I'm calling the Newtonian way. Or you could do the Einsteinian way, which is say, no, there is, gravity isn't a force. You just imagine falling with it. So that's what the big arrow is doing here. You fall with the gravitational field. And in that falling frame, there isn't a gravitational field. If you do it that way, there's no field, but you've got to transform back to compare it with what you had before. And you just use the simple equations which I've got written here to do that. But don't worry about it if you don't want to. But the thing is, if you do that, just what I just said, and compare the Einsteinian with the Newtonian way, you get almost the same thing. You get something where your state, your quantum state, differs by what's called a phase. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. But it's what people normally say doesn't matter. And so it doesn't matter which you use. That's true, provided you don't want to have something where you have two gravitational fields superimposed on each other. So you have a quantum gravitational field. And the example which I'm having here is a sort of Schrodinger's cat, but not a cat, it's just a lump of material. So what I'm imagining is that you, instead of put, putting your cat into one door or the other, or dead or alive, or whatever it is, you put a lump of material which is in one place or another. So I'm sorry, I'm doing it again. I don't seem to have the skill to making this thing work properly. Um, there's a button at the top, which somehow I don't seem to have. Oh, here we've got it. Yes, yeah, so the thing is a lump is in the superposition 
in two, uh, one place and another. So, as I said, quantum particles can be in one place and another, or molecules can be in one place and another at the same time. And for some reason, when they get big, it doesn't seem to work. Now, the idea here, here is, OK, we have a lump in two places at once, which it could be, and we now go up the picture, this is time progressing. Now, these lines at the side, well, these lines here represent the distortion of the space-time that the gravitational field is uh, described by uh, for the lump here and for the lump here. So these two different space-times are somehow superimposed together. And these lines at the side represent the different accelerating frames. So it's a bit like the picture I just had a minute ago, where uh, something might be falling freely. And if it's falling freely in the Einsteinian picture, that means that's one of these curves. Now, if the lump's in one place, the lines curve one way. If the lump's in the other place, they curve slightly differently. And it's the incompatibility between those two which leads you into trouble. And that's where this phase factor in the language of quantum field theory, you have two different vacua, and you're not allowed to make superpositions when you're in different vacua. So those of you who know what that means will know what that means. So it's in different... You're doing something which is, according to the standard rules of quantum mechanics, cheating. So that cheat, however, takes a little while to manifest itself. And so that gives this superposition of those two locations a certain lifetime before something's going to happen. And that's the idea. So the picture that I have next, if I can get it to come up, here we go. That's again the same thing, but it looks more complicated. That's because, well, time is still going up the picture. Here's the lump in one place. Now it becomes a superposition of two places. It lasts for a while, and then one dies off, and the other one survives. Now, how long does that take? Well, as a rough measure, you take the volume here, this is a volume which is a difference between the two... It's a four-dimensional volume, which is a difference between the two geometries here and here. It's a little bit difficult to explain what that means, but it's where you use units which are called natural units. Now, what are natural units or Planck units? Well, you could take the speed of light to be equal to one. Now, that's just units, you see. You could say, suppose you're measuring seconds, and then you say, instead of using meters, you use a light second. Now, a light second is the length of uh, the distance it would take light to go a second. And if you use seconds and light seconds, the speed of light is one. So you can get rid of the speed of light, that's one. You can get rid of the gravitational constant in a similar sort of way, and you can get rid of Planck's constant in a similar sort of way. And when you've done all that, you've got what are called natural units. And in, those, in those natural units, once the, how long does it take for this thing one branch to survive and the other to die, well, it's when that volume, where they differ, is of one unit. So if there's a good, big spatial difference, it'll happen very quickly. So with the cat, you see, that makes a big spatial difference, but the time scale is then very small. But if they're particles, it'll take a long time before the thing has to make a choice between one or the other. So that's the idea. And... OK, it's sort of qualitative. It doesn't give you a, a detailed theory of what happens, but it gives you an estimate of how long it takes for a superposition to become one or the other. And as I say, for, for neutrons, individual particles say it might take longer than the age of the universe, but for a cat, it would be virtually instantaneous. So that's the difference between those two cases. And, um, well, another feature about this is unlike quantum gravity, when you bring gravity change to quantum mechanics, there are experiments which could tell whether this is right or not. And this is a cartoon of an experiment which has been under progress uh, by Dirk Baumeister, who's been working in, in Leiden, in the Netherlands, and in Santa Barbara in the United States. And it's much more elaborate than what we see here. But the general idea is that you have a a laser, oh dear, I've done it again. I don't quite know why, why I keep pressing the wrong button. I've done it, yeah, that's it. Here we have a laser which emits a single photon. It's a beam splitter, so its existence is shared between going this way and this way. And then you keep this one backwards and forwards, reflecting backwards and forwards between two mirrors. This one also reflects backwards and forwards about a million times, but it hits this little tiny mirror here, 
That little mirror is about a tenth of the thickness of a human hair, and so it's just too small to see, but nevertheless, it's banged by this photon roughly a million times before you release the photon and try and come back again, and it hits it and displaces it by, well, maybe about the diameter of an atomic nucleus. Not very much. So it's not much of a Schrodinger's cat, but maybe enough of one. And the idea is that it would take, depending on details, a matter of seconds or minutes before this should become one or the other. And that should be detectable by trying to bring these photons back again and seeing whether they ever get up, get up that way. I don't want to worry about the details here. There are a lot more which are not ex expressed in this picture. But the general idea is expressed, and it could well be that within the next decade there will be an answer to this. So it's a genuine something experimental that we want to decide whether it's true or not. Okay, what about the fantasy? So that was the faith. Faith was that quantum mechanics holds at all levels and one should not try and change it. Uh, the fantasy. Well, you see, I suggested this term because with certain ideas about cosmology, which I thought were really too, too far-fetched to believe, and then I had my own idea, which is also, I think a lot of cosmologists feel are too far-fetched to believe too. So I am a little more sympathetic towards fantasy than I was before, because I think maybe we need some fantasy, otherwise we're not going to explain. Well, quantum mechanics is a pretty fantastical theory, and we need that fantasy, as it seems, in order to explain the way the world behaves. So something like that could well be true. Let me explain this picture, because this picture... Um, is a space-time diagram. Time is going up, picture as before. Here's the Big Bang at the bottom. Expands, expands out, and then it slows down a bit, and it starts to expand again. This is what's called the exponential expansion that seems to be taking place. People call it the course of dark energy, they call it. I don't like the term dark energy. I prefer calling it the Einstein cosmological constant that he introduced in 1917, admittedly for the wrong reason, but... Nevertheless, he did introduce it. So this is the way the universe seems to be behaving. If you want to know what all the frilly bits are at the back, that's simply because I don't want to prejudice the issue as to whether the universe is actually closed or open. It might be open, it might be closed. It doesn't matter for what I want to say here. It's, it's pretty close to being flat and open, but it still could curve around and be closed. We don't know, is the answer. Now, we're somewhere in the middle here and we see this beginnings of this exponential expansion. So that's not a bad picture of what the universe looks like. Some people might complain, however, that right down at the beginning, there is supposed to be something called inflation. Now, inflation would look like another copy of this e exponential expanding unit, much, much bigger, going way off into the distance there, all tucked into that little point at the bottom. So maybe I've drawn it there, tucked into that little corner point at the bottom, or maybe I haven't. I probably haven't because I don't believe it. Uh, but standard cosmologists would say there ought to be inflation tucked in there, taking place in the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds, a ridiculously tiny fraction of a second. And it's supposed to be expanded by this enormous amount. Now, I never liked that theory, partly because it didn't explain some of the things it was meant to explain. It later on acquired things that it does explain well. So it's a mixture of things, things that it was claimed to explain and doesn't, and certain things which it does do. And let me come first to one of the things that it claims to explain and doesn't. And that is... Oh, first of all, yes, this is the picture. This is just to give you some feeling. In order to have inflation, you have to introduce a field which is called the inflaton field. And in order to make the inflaton field do what you want, you have to draw a curve. This curve is the potential function for that field. There's no theoretical reason why it should do this or that, no from particle physics, why it should do this or the other thing. So these things are more or less drawn by hand, and you can see the different shapes that this curve can have, drawn by different people, in order to have the properties that it's supposed to have for inflation. I only just you have those pictures to give you some feeling of the variety of the different shapes that the curves can have. And they have the same general sort of character, but they, in detail, don't look anything like each other. Now, why, don't, why do I say it doesn't 
explain... Well, what do I say? It doesn't explain. It doesn't explain, as it claims, why the universe is so uniform. So the picture was, you have some big bang, which could be a great mess, and then, because of inflation, it gets stretched out and stretched out and stretched out until it looks practically flat. And that was the idea of why it looks so pretty flat. And my, one of my reasons for not really liking that idea or not believing it is the following. Let's imagine a universe. Maybe our universe is closed up, and maybe this is before <coughs> people no noticed the exponential expansion. But it could have been that it came collapsing again, sort of expand and then collapse. Or could have been collapsing and then collapse into a great mess. Now, this is a very general kind of singularity mess. I've just drawn it like to looking like a mess, deliberately. And if you turn that upside down, so that you now have a possible beginning, that beginning, you see, this, think about this one here, because that's a bit like our exp exponentially expanding universe upside down. It could be quite irregular here. And those irregularities will simply make this mess worse. That worse mess could have been the beginning. And there's nothing, you could put your infliton field in, it doesn't stretch it out at all. It's just that only very simple kinds of original singularity can be stretched out, and most of them it doesn't work for. And simple arguments like looking at pictures like this will show that it doesn't work in general. So that argument is just not right. Um, this illustrates something else which I want to say. It's an important part of physics, which for some reason I find very much is ignored by cosmologists, and I never quite understood why. It's what I sometimes call the mammoth in the room, and it's not much noticed by people, but it's so completely obvious to physics. Well, here's an example. It's the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says, roughly speaking, things get more and more random as time goes on, or more manifestly random as time goes on. And the measure of this sort of randomness is a thing called entropy. And according to standard physics, that entropy is increasing, so the world is getting more and more manifestly random. That's a pretty depressing law, you might say, but that's what we seem to see. And it's illustrated often by a gas in a box, and you might say that this gas is initially uh, contained within a little compartment here. Then you open the compartment up, and it spreads out. So this uniform state, if it's just a gas, represents... A high entropy state, that's a low entropy state, and as entropy increases, it spreads out. But suppose this is gravitating bodies. Suppose these are a lot of stars in some galactic scale box. What happens? Because they attract each other gravitationally, they start to clump, and it sort of goes the other way. Um, now, what we see in the early universe is this uniformity, which is the mixture of this top right hand and bottom left hand pictures. So these two things seem to be combined together in what we see. But then as far as the matter is concerned, yes, indeed, it's high entropy, it's very random. When I say yes, indeed, that's what we see. But as far as gravity is concerned, it's very low entropy and low random. So this is an observed feature of the universe. And the elephant in the, or the mammoth in the room is this very strange feature that gravity is so different from everything else. And why is it like that? And you see people say, what are the big puzzles of cosmology? And they list them like this. And where is this thing? It's not even mentioned. It always seemed to me that this is the major problem of cosmology, to understand why it is so imbalanced. Everything else is all randomized completely, except gravity. And you've got to have something which is not randomized, because, well, if the entropy is going up and up and up now, and if the second law held in the past it must have gone down and down and down and down in the past. So the Big Bang must have been a very, very special low entropy state. As far as the matter is concerned, it's way up here in the high entropy. But as far as gravity is concerned, it's very, very special. And moreover, it's what we live off. Why do I say that? Well, why, how, what does life depend on crucially? Well, people say it depends on getting energy from the sun. That's not quite right, because the, basically all the energy we get from the sun goes out in the night, it all goes back again. So we get it from the sun, it goes back again. So we don't gain energy. The, what do we do gain is energy in a low entropy form. I won't go into the details of that, but it's what the plants use, is this, this fact that the sun is a hot spot in a dark sky. 
And that is what we depend upon. And why is that? It's because the sun used to be uniform distribution, but it gained in its lowness of entropy, if you like, by calling upon this reservoir of low entropy in the gravitational field being all uniform. And that's why we have a hot spot in the sky which we all live off. And that's great that it's there, but it doesn't... Uh, explain anything about where it came from. I have in the bottom right-hand corner a b where the real entropy goes in black holes. If you ask where is now, right now, where is the most entropy in the universe? Well, the, there's this microwave background radiation coming to us. It's pretty high entropy, but that's nothing. That's complete chicken feed compared with the entropy in black holes. There's the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, which tells us how much entropy there is in a black hole. And our galaxy contains a black hole which is about four million times the mass of the sun. That's a huge amount of entropy. Universe as a whole, by enormous factor, the entropy is almost entirely in black holes. So that's the big factor. That's what we've got to understand. And so here we have in this bottom right-hand picture uh, a black hole sitting there, and that is where the hugest entropy comes. It clumps and clumps and clumps, and where it gets to black holes, that's where the big entropy is. Okay, so that's the general picture. And let me go back to this, if you like. The first picture there is showing how the initial low ent gravitational entropy here in the initial singularity, which is very, very smooth, becomes this very complicated singularity at the end, which is very high entropy. And it's in the gravity. It's the difference between these singularities, the smooth one at the back and the complicated one at the front. And that's really the big mystery to explain that, uh, which people apparently don't seem to worry so much about. Well, here's a black hole for you, just to show what it looks like. It doesn't look like to look at, but it looks like if you draw a diagram of it. And the main thing I want to say here, I don't want to talk too much about it, but you have the horizon, which is the cylinder thing in the middle there. Time going up the picture, uh, as before, and uh, these cones all over the place are what I really want to talk about. They tell you that signals can't get out from inside the horizon there. Uh, you can look at the pictures in the book if you want to know. What are these cones? They're what are called light cones or null cones, and they represent how a flash of light would behave. So you see the central picture is a light cone, and on the left, we see the interpretation of that in space terms. So you imagine a flash of light here, it expands out, and there we have it starts in the middle, next, next, goes bigger and bigger and bigger. You could have the converging light on a point here too. But it represents the limit of what particles can do. They have to be inside the cones. And you have to imagine that at each point in the space-time is one of these cones. So that's the way we think about space-time. And here's an example. You think of your space-time. The main structure is these cones. And they tell you how light behaves and how particles are constrained to move so that their world lines always lie within the cones. And that is most of general relativity in a clear sense, and most of the picture of space-time. The one thing that's missing from this picture of space-time is the clocks. So you need something which measures the scale of things. The light cone does most of it, but you need something which measures the scale. And if you imagine clocks, uh, they will tick away, and there will be these little surfaces that I've got drawn here which represent the first tick and the second tick and the third tick of the clocks. Now, we have in nature extremely good clocks. In fact, there are extraordinarily precise clocks which can even, from here to here, they can measure the effect of the, the slowing of a clock due to gravity when it's down here, from at here. Clocks are so precise that even with little distances like that, you can measure the clock differences due to gravity. It's an amazing thing. Now, what's the reason for these clocks being so good? Ultimately, it's because of the two most fundamental equations of 20th century physics. One of them has to be Einstein's E equals mc squared, of course. So that's the bottom one here, or the middle one there. The other one is Planck, Max Planck's E equals h nu. E is an energy again, and nu is a frequency. So Einstein says energy is equivalent to, to, energy is equivalent to, to mass, E equals mc squared, Planck says energy is equivalent to frequency. Put the two together, that tells you mass is equivalent to frequency. In other words, a stable particle is a little clock. 
It clocks extraordinarily precisely because of these very basic laws which govern its rate of ticking. So the clock particles are clocks, and they're very, very precise clocks. So if you have these atomic or nuclear clocks, whatever they happen to be, they ultimately depend on this. They're, of course, not one particle, so you have to get the information out in a way, but, but basically it's because of that. But there's another feature of this picture. Suppose you didn't have any mass. Suppose there were no particles with mass. Then everything would go zipping along the light cone, and there wouldn't be any clocks. If there are no clocks, there are no distances either. The meter rule, what's the definition of a meter now? Well, it used to be there's a meter rule in Paris, and that was the definition of a meter. That's no good anymore, not nearly accurate enough. You define it in terms of a second. You say it's in the exact length of time that, that uh, a meter is a certain fraction of a, of a light second, an exact fraction, which is the definition of it. So it's clocks. That is what gives you the scales of things. Now, if you have a kind of geometry which doesn't have scales, in space-time, what it more or less means is you've got this picture. That is, you know the light cones, but you don't have the clocks. And if you just had particles, photons, particles of light, you wouldn't have any clocks. So this would be the relevant geometry. Now, when is this the relevant geometry? Well, I was once worrying about the fate of our universe, and something I do from time to time, not just what's happening on the world, which may be depressing enough, but, but the universe as a whole. And, well, there's what I call the, ver the boring era, is where there's nothing, virtually nothing left but black holes. That's the boring era. Black holes are quite boring if they just sit there. But then they evaporate away, and the very boring era is when they've all gone by. This is where the Google years has gone by. And what's left? Just photons running around. Well, that's a pretty boring universe. And this, I admit, is an emotional argument, but it seemed to me it's not a very happy picture for the world we live in to be end up with this extraordinarily boring state with nothing happening. And then I thought, who's going to be bored by this universe? Not us. Mainly photons. And it's very hard to bore a photon, I'll tell you. Because, not just because photons probably don't experience anything, but because um, photons just zip along the light cone. And the photon, if, you can, if I can use the word experience, experiences no time from its emission to its absorption. It's just nothing. And so it doesn't mind. The entire universe zips by and nothing for a photon. So it's not boring at all as far as photons are concerned. Okay, that's an emotional argument. But that's half the argument. And let me give you this half here, if I've got the right picture here. Here it is. You see, this is a nice Escher picture illustrating a kind of geometry that these fish live in. And this kind of geometry is what's called hyperbolic space. It's not important to know what that is here. But the point is that it's a conformal picture. Conformal means that I don't care about sizes, I just compare about shapes, or basically small shapes. Or you look at the eyes of the fish, they look like circles, they're exact circles, no matter how close to the boundary you get. The fish, small scale, they look just the same as the ones in the middle. So the shapes, at least for small shapes, they're perfectly represented in this picture. However, you can also represent infinity. See, the infinity of this world is the circle around the outside. So it's a very nice representation. I've done it again. Press the wrong button. It's a very nice representation where infinity is represented as a finite place. So if you don't care about the scale, you just care about the conformal geometry, in other words, you just care about the light cones, this geometry, then infinity is just perfectly like anywhere else. And so here's a picture. Now take the bottom part of the picture up to that line in the middle, that wiggly line in the middle. That represents infinity of our universe, if you like. And as far as these massless particles, the photons, it's just like another surface. They don't, it's like anywhere else. They just go zipping through it. They go zipping through infinity. Well, what do they find on the other side? Well, according to this scheme, what they find on the other side is another place where mass doesn't matter. And that is near the Big Bang. If you go back in time, back in time, back in time, until you get into the Big Bang, where temperatures go up and up and up, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, it gets so energetic, particles move around so fast, that their energy is entirely in their motion, or almost entirely. The mass 
is completely irrelevant. So everything, more or less, behaves like photons. So again, it's this conformal kind of geometry. So what I'm saying is that the bottom part of the picture represents our infinity, and the top part of the picture represents somebody else's Big Bang. Now, it's also interesting that it's a Big Bang which has this kind of geometry where the gravitational degrees of freedom are suppressed. So we can now imagine that the top part is really our universe. This line across represents our Big Bang, and bef below it represents somebody else's universe before us. And the reason that our universe was so smooth is not because of inflation, it's because there was a previous eon, as I'm calling it, which was there before. And so this is my crazy picture. This is my fantasy, you see, which I rather like because it doesn't have inflation in it. It has something else instead of inflation. In fact, as I said before, you, you really need something. If you don't have inflation, you've got to have something else. You have to have a pre-Big Bang theory. That's more or less it. So this thing up here, that's meant to be our eon. That's us. We're somewhere down here. The universe will do this expansion, and then it goes out to infinity. And one of these things is squashing it down, like in the Escher picture, the future boundary. Stretch out the Big Bang. That's my colleague Paul Todd, who had this way of looking at the initial conditions on the Big Bang. And you stretch it out, and the picture is that that was just the rewriting of the future infinity of the eon before us. So this is our eon. There was one before. There was one before that. There will be one after us, and so on, like that. And uh, they fit beautifully, is the idea. So the conformal geometry extends quite smoothly from one to the other. You might say, how can a very, very non, uh, very undense, rarefied, infinite universe, very cold, be equivalent to a very hot, dense beginning of the universe? Well, that's the way it works. If you stretch and squash, the very cold thing becomes hot if you squash it. The hot thing becomes cold when you stretch it. And it perfectly well fits. That's the idea. Anyway, I thought I'd land you with this piece of fantasy of my own. I believe there are actually some observational facts which seem to support this picture. We're trying to convince other people that it does, which is a hard job. But let me leave you with that, and thank you very much. Thank you so much for a wonderful uh, lecture, exceptionally wide-ranging, starting with uh, rubbing sticks together via uh, Anderson's uh, mermaid to the latest uh, <laughs> physics. Uh, we are all uh, amazed, and uh, as a tour through uh, fashion, faith, and uh, fantasy, I think uh, we can say it was uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, Thank you. I will be uh, taking... Uh, questions, uh, guiding questions uh, together with uh, Caroline Mo here. Uh, I'm, by the way, Snorri Christensen from the math department. Uh, and uh, there are probably some books left, so if you're lucky, you can, uh, you can buy them. And uh, we will have a book signing after the questions uh, here on the, uh, on the stage. So the uh, floor is open for questions to you. Uh, I was curious, this last uh, picture of yours, does that uh, relate somehow to the anthropic principle? I'm, I'm over here. The anthropic principle? Uh, yeah. What was the question? This, this, this last picture of yours, is that somehow related to the anthropic principle? Oh, the principle? anthropic principle. Not very much, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, you see, I'm, uh, the anthropic principle is, there's a bit of a discussion of that in the book, I should say, quite a, quite a section on the anthropic principle. I should explain to people who don't know what that term means. It really comes about when you have a theory, and this theory um, maybe has some numbers in it, which might have one value or might have another value and it might have another value. And uh, what you might find is that for some values of that number, the theory behaves in a way which doesn't allow for life to exist, whereas it may be certain very special values where life, at least as life as we know it, could exist. And so the argument is that maybe all these universes are coexist in some sense, but the only one that could have 
intelligent beings in it are ones for which the numbers have those specific values. Now, I find it's a very limited value. It's usually a principle which is adopted when your theory uh, gives up at a certain place. And it's actually, I should say, it's where string theory has largely gone now, but it's the thing known as the, the landscape. You have so many different versions of string theory, and the question is, which one is it that, that is the universe we see? Well, the argument is say, well, only a very small number of these universes will actually accommodate the numbers that we need for life to exist. I find it very difficult to follow that kind of argument because, um, well, I, I feel it's sort of place uh, uh, is a rather giving up at this point. It means your theory isn't isn't strong enough to make proper predictions. But uh, also, we don't really know what it is that leads to life. I mean, you could have all sorts of funny kinds of life which don't depend on carbon, don't depend on all sorts of things that we know are around. So how do we know? So, uh, but it is an, it is an, an argument which, which is used often by people, usually in connection with thinking of parallel universes. So you imagine these different universes, not like these. In this picture, it's a sequential universe, not parallel. So you could have an anthropic argument that some of these eons might have numbers in them which... Uh, uh, which allow life and some don't. I don't like that. It's just an opinion, if you like, at this moment. I think there is some very feeble evidence in this scheme that the numbers don't change significantly from eon to eon, that they're not grossly different, at least. I would like to think they're actually the same. We do have numbers in physics which we don't understand. Uh, for example, why the particle masses have the values they have in relation to the, the unit mass according to the Planck units, which is enormously larger than the particles. So there's some great puzzles about large numbers which come into physics and what's the reason for them. We don't know. It might be an anthropic argument, which is why, we, why they have the values they have. But I'm not too favorable with, I'm not favorably disposed to those types of argument. But it's an open question. The floor is open to questions. Uh, Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Very good question. Well, you see, when yep. I thought of this, it took me a little while to figure out something you might see. I tried to think, what is the most violent thing I could think of which could get a signal, you see here, if I can the this button again, some signal from here which could get through and be seen by us. And the most violent thing I could think of is the, a collision between two supermassive black holes. In our galaxy, as I, I said before, we have a four million solar mass black hole in the center of our galaxy. We are on a collision course, so I'm told, with the Andromeda galaxy, take a few thousand million years before we actually collide, but they have a much bigger black hole, I think 40 times as big or something like that, and these two black holes will eventually feel each other out and slam into each other, and there will be a violent, tremendous explosion of the kind that the LIGO uh, data observe, but much bigger. So they've seen black hole collisions of something like 30 solar mass, 30 times the mass of the sun. But these are things where you've got millions and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of solar masses. And that explosion will be absolutely enormous. And the information of an explosion, let's suppose it's happening down here, will make, will make its mark on the crossover and that will make its mark on the microwave background. And that microwave background is the radiation. It's about 380,000 uh, years after the Big Bang, but it's still quite close to the Big Bang in sort of general terms. And the effects would make a mark that you could detect in the microwave background. And with a colleague, of, an Armenian colleague of mine, Vahe Guzajan, and a Polish group quite independent of us, headed by Christoph Meisner, we both, by quite different ways, have been looking to see if these signals are there. And although it's disputed by various people, um, we do seem to see the signals. And what's rather striking about them is, first of all, they should be circular features. And if you 
look for slightly elliptical features, the signal goes way down. So it's something about them being circles. And the second thing is that the centers of these circles, which would be where the explosions take place, are very concentrated in certain regions. So they're here, or here, or here. Just a few particular regions, <coughs> which seem to, on the interpretation here, seem to be as a result of some huge um, super-duper clusters in the previous eon. So these would be things going on in the... That's the idea. Of course, it could be the artifacts of something, but it's a bit strange that by quite different methods, the poles also see these signals. And both of us see the signals both in the uh, uh, WMAP data, which was the older satellite, and the Planck data, which was the more recent, more precise one. And the signals are still there. And the existence of these signals is also confirmed by, other group, by another group. The question of the interpretation is, is what you know, we might argue about. And some people say, no, they're random effects that could be there uh, just by chance. I c personally don't see how that could be the case because they're so non-uniform in, in their distribution and um, other things which I think are in good reasons to believe they're genuine. But, but I mean, it's arguments. You'll find people on both sides. I don't know if I can stretch it, but can you look the other way? <laughs> can I what? Can you look the other way to the future? <laughs> to the future? <laughs> ah, there's a tougher one. I don't know how you look into the future. I suppose you could use <laughs> um, crystals, magic. <laughs> no, <laughs> I have no idea how you look into the future. I mean, you could have a model where it just loops around, you see, and it's one cycle instead of going on for infinity. That leads you into, into difficulties. So I don't propose that scheme. Um, if it did loop around, then you could look into the future by looking into the past. But I think that lands into, into paradoxes, so I'm not too happy with that. No, I don't see how you could look into the future. You could make predictions, I suppose, the future. You could s guess that some beings in this future would see rings in the cosmic microwave background because of our collision with Andromeda Galaxy. But that's not much help to anybody. <laughs> Well, I have a relevant que related question to the idea of the same topic. Yes? Now that we're launching satellites to be able to measure gravitational waves yeah. uh, of other kinds than the one that LIGO does, uh, if we're successful in this, we'll be able to get any information to confirm or reject inflation theory or shed any light on what is actually happening? Of course, that's a, an alternative. I should see these are can't schemes that can't coexist. So we can't have inflation in this model. I should say, perhaps I didn't make this point clearly, but I should say that in a certain sense there is an inflation because this part, see this previous eon, is a bit like inflation. It's not after the Big Bang, you see 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang, it's actually before the Big Bang, which was an idea which was introduced also by, by Veneziano, who had the model which had a similar, character, similar characteristic. But if, if there was good evidence for inflation, that would be bad news for this model. And there are certainly um, ideas about detecting gravitational waves in the early universe, which certain versions of inflation, do, you do expect to see them. Uh, there was this BICEP2 observations a year and a half ago, whenever it was, there was a claim to have seen these early gravitational waves that was sort of rather um, discounted more recently by people thinking that the effects that you see, these things called B modes, in, in the polarization of the early radiation. And these things were argued to be indica indication of gravitational waves in the early universe. That would be bad news for this model if they were. The current view seems to be that the evidence is not very good and that it could be due to dust out there. I have a different take on it, which is it could be something yet again, namely primordial magnetic fields, because that's another test of this theory. You could get magnetic fields coming through from one eon to the next, and you would expect that. So this is another test of this theory. It hasn't been explored very much, but you might be able to see the magnetic fields which are attached to galactic clusters. We know there are magnetic fields running out in in space, 
in clusters of galaxies uh, and in galaxies. And so you should maybe be able to detect those magnetic fields by looking down in the microwave background. And these magnetic fields might be confused with the B modes that people think are due to gravitational waves. So you've got to be very careful to disentangle different effects that might be there. Okay, I um, want to turn to quantum mechanics. Yes. Um, there are many interpretations of quantum mechanics, and uh, some of the recent interpretations are claiming that the wave function expresses our knowledge about it. Oh, yes, universe. yes. What do you think of these interpretations? Well, I never liked any of those very much. That certainly was the sort of Niels Bohr type of interpretation, that the reason that the jumps look as though they happen, the jumps in our knowledge and not in the real world. I've never quite been able to make sense of that, but that, that certainly is the view that's been expressed. So that's one view. Another view expressed is that it's somehow a conscious being looks at the system and then it does the conscious being perceives one or the other. I don't like that one either because, for example, you might have a distant planet which has uh, a Earth-like planet, say, which has an atmosphere and clouds and things like it, like we have. But the because it's a chaotic system, the weather, very tiny effects will make very big differences in the weather. So quantum effects will make big differences in the weather. So you would have a weather which was a quantum superposition of all the different weathers. It would look like a mess. Okay, well now a satellite is sent out to examine this planet. And when it gets close enough, it takes a photograph and sends the information back to the Earth. And only when a conscious being looks at this plate, photographic plate, and suddenly whap, 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 and it changes the weather on the planet. I don't believe that. <laughs> That's more, more extreme than Schrodinger's cat. And then there's the many worlds interpretation, which I did mention, where all these different things happen. So there are all these arguments which say, basically, it's a matter of interpretation. Don't change quantum mechanics, but interpret it correctly. So that's a common view. Uh, I don't take that view. I take the view it's not a matter of interpretation. It is a question of what the world is really doing. It's a much more objective picture. And that this world is doing something like that sawtooth, which I showed, but it has to be part of a better theory which th makes all that coherent in some sense. And we don't have that theory as yet. So that's my view. But as, as the majority of people who work in quantum mechanics tend to regard it as a matter of interpretation in one way or another. There are many conferences on interpretation of quantum mechanics and uh, people are arguing all the ways. There have been some recent uh, very extreme interpretation, the quantum Bayesian interpretation, which is saying that the uh, wave function is uh, our belief, subjective belief. What was that again? I didn't quite catch. Uh, quantum Bayesianism. Quantum? Bayesianism. Oh, Bayesianism, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've heard people talk about that, and I'm never quite sure what it was. I mean, I know what Bayes' theorem is and so on, but I didn't, don't know what uh, Bayesianism is in this context. But I have heard people talk about it. But it sounds like an interpretation thing as well. And then there are things I should have mentioned, the... the um, environmental decoherence point of view, I don't know how that fits in, fits in with the Bayesian interpretation thing, where you somehow information gets lost in the environment and then you can forget about it. But it all, I always thought those arguments were not consistent in the ontology. They, they, you have a certain view of what the real world is and then you go from a state, you say probability mixture of states, density matrix, reinterpret the density matrix, probability of states in a different way. And you've got a a loop which is not ontologically consistent. So I've, I've never seen any interpretation which doesn't involve changing actual quantum mechanics, which to me makes sense. I mean, there are all sorts of views, like, like the ones that you mentioned, and which many people will swear by, but I have a lot of trouble making them make sense. <laughs> but of course, this scheme that I'm proposing here is testable. So if it goes the wrong way for me, I've got to think of another <laughs> scheme. But at least it, it, it does provide a testable proposal, which is di dif differs from standard quantum mechanics. Um, I believe that, uh, <coughs> that, uh, uh, that entropy could only be uh, increased 
And are you saying at the crossover points, entropy actually goes from maximum to minimum? It goes back down again. Yeah. Well, there are views that people have such schemes. You know, have a universe which expands maybe, and as it contracts again, the entropy's got to go the other way. I find great trouble with that, particularly with black holes, because the black holes will survive through into the other, to the other stage. And how do you get the black holes to behave when they're the wrong way around? <laughs> I know people have proposed things like that, where the entropy may go run the other way. And OK, one has to take that kind of idea seriously. But I think it doesn't resolve the big puzzles that we... You see, this scheme does... I mean, there is a que I wondered whether somebody would ask me this question, because there is a, a sort of puzzle you see here. If entropy is increasing all the time, how can it be increasing all the way time in this scheme? Well, you see, the answer in my scheme is that, as I said before, most of the entropy is in black holes. And it gets more and more in black holes as time goes on. And then as you wait and you wait, you wait a Google years or so, then the black holes evaporate away. Now, according to Stephen Hawking, originally, black holes sw swallow information. And that means that they sw swallow degrees of freedom. According to Stephen Hawking's later view, where he changed his mind, that somehow the information gets out. I think he was right the first time. And that means information is swallowed, or degrees of freedom are swallowed. And that means that even though the entropy is going up, there comes a point when you say you're not going to take into consideration those degrees of freedom which are swallowed. And when you come to that point, you redefine what you mean by the entropy. And that's what comes down. It's not that the entropy... It any consistent entropy interpretation will be going up all the time, but it comes inappropriate after the black holes evaporate. And then the effective entropy that you want to use is much lower again. But it's quite subtle. And to make sense of it in this scheme, you do need to have Hawking number one, not Hawking number two. Because Hawking number two uh, tried to maintain that the information comes back somehow. Whereas I say no, the information, the degrees of freedom, have to be swallowed by the black hole, and they're gone. And that's what allows one to consider the useful entropy to, to be increasing all the time. Uh, well, it, it decreases once the, once the black hole is gone. You say, OK, I changed my mind. I'm using a new definition which doesn't use those degrees of freedom. And that's how to make sense of it. But all these things need more careful looking at. I think it makes sense, but it, you would need to have a, a much more quantitative <coughs> descriptions to, to see whether that really hangs together. So there are interesting questions which need to be looked at here. Um, <coughs> according to your um, uh, theory of the role of gravity in quantum mechanics, uh, how large um, uh, do you think an object could be and be represented by a spatial superposition state with a lifetime long enough to be comparable to uh, times that could be perceived by uh, human beings. So what time did you say? Comparable with? So, um, with a lifetime that could be comparable to uh, times that can be perceived by human beings. Well, this is the, the sort of thing I'm talking about with this Baumeister experiment. You see, you're looking at something which is in a superposition, and the time scale is quite perceivable by a human being. It's a few minutes or seconds, depending on the details. It's, it's a... a Say, say roughly a minute. And that's certainly perceivable by a human being. Yes, yes. And this would be a material object which, okay, with a good lens or microscope, you could see it. Okay, okay. But its m displacement between the two states is about uh, a nuclear diameter, or maybe a bit more, I don't know, in the actual experiments. So these are things you could grasp, but they're not, they're not that far away. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's wrong, and they don't... Superpositions persist, and I'm wrong. That could be. But this is what I'm. If it's wrong, then it needs something else, and <laughs> a better theory than I'm saying here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can ask a question myself, uh, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, I, I've been struck by the pictures in your talk, and you also have introduced so many notations and diagrammatic. Uh, representations of uh, advanced uh, stuff. So I, I wondered how 
this uh, pictorial way of thinking could uh, relate to, to their creative process? Uh. Well, I think it's different for different people. I mean, I certainly think very visually, I, I admit that, that I would much prefer a visual description of something than, than a long formula. But, of course, you sometimes have to use long formulae, so but often I would try to develop visual notations for formulae, too. But it's just the way I happen to think. And that many people find this more difficult. Curiously enough, I find among mathematicians, often they're not very visual. And if I would give a course with a lot of visual things, they find this more confusing <laughs> than if there were lots more formulae. But I think there may be a selection effect that examinations are rather unfair on the visual people. <laughs> because, I mean, I find this myself. I could do the geometrical questions, and I know how to do them, but then to do them, you need to translate into writing. And the writing is going from one part of the brain to the other, and it would be quite slow. And I would find that more difficult than doing the algebra, because the algebra is all doing one thing. Okay. So in some ways, I feel it's a bit of a disadvantage to be a visual person, and that the people in the, in the mathematics lecturers, uh, <laughs> the undergraduates, are often not very visual which is a bit paradoxical, because some people say, oh, I want you to give a lecture to this group of people. They're not very mathematical. They'd like lots and lots of pictures. So that's fine. I can do lots of pictures. <laughs> but, but it's the natural way I would describe things. And if they're not math so mathematical, they tend to prefer the pictures. Mm. So maybe we can take that into account in our teaching reform going on. Uh, again, uh, thank you so much uh, on behalf of uh, the mathematics department and the science library. We're thrilled to have you here. Thank you. And we have a small gift from, Ooh, the, uh, from the university. Wow, what's, oh well, gosh, that'll keep me warm. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, great. Thank you. Okay. So, we will have a book signing uh, up okay. here. Uh, yeah. And we will be queuing uh, along the mid uh, aisle. Was this my glass? Uh, there was one here, wasn't there? I, I should have stacked it up. Both of them. Well, I didn't touch that one. <laughs>